Hi everyone and welcome back to The Journey. As you can see, today we're going to be talking about ALS, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now, to begin with, we have it is a loss of motor neurons and the motor neurons that um, are lost is pretty much the nerve cells that are controlling the muscles in the anterior horns of the spinal cord and the motor nuclei of the lower brain stem. Okay? It is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. So a lot of you guys may know it by the name of Lou Gehrig's disease because it was a famous baseball player who had um, gotten this disease and it went, it spread it worldwide and people were just like so in shock um, that he had it. So they named it pretty much after him. So that's the other term, but the more correct term is ALS. Okay? Now, the motor neuron cell dies and with it dying, the muscle fibers that are supply undergo atrophic changes and the name of atrophy just pretty much means a shrinkage so it shrinks in size in both the upper and lower motor neuron system okay now the reason for that is because they have a theory it's not um you know known to be this for sure for sure but it is a strong theory and it is pretty much an overexcitation of the nerve cells by the neurotransmitters um, by the name of glutamate that results in cell injury and um, neuronal degeneration, all right? So the causes for that is, again, it's unknown, same as GBS and multiple sclerosis, right? We don't know exactly what is causing it, but it is related to an autoimmune disease, okay? And it also um, can be caused by free radical damage as well as oxidative stress, okay? And five to 10% is caused by genetic predisposition where you have the autosomal dominant trait for familial ALS, okay? So pretty much in other words, you can either have it because of genetics or the fact that you just have an autoimmune that can be triggered by a virus, stress, whatever the case may be, but um, it ha does have a link to autoimmune and genetic. All right, so now we have our clinical manifestations, which is also known as our signs and symptoms, which is also known as our nursing assessment. All right, so it depends on the location of the affected motor neuron is going to exhibit those particular signs and symptoms, okay? But just overall, general, they're going to be fatigued. There is going to be a progressive muscle weakness, okay? So as the years go on, it is only going to get worse, okay? They may uh, complain about cramps, twitching, incoordination, okay? A loss of motor neurons in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Is going to have atrophy of the arms, the trunk area, and the legs. Okay, so arm, trunk, and legs are going to be shrunken or um, smaller in size. Okay, the muscle itself. Okay, also the spasticity and deep tendon reflex is going to be something that they complain about. And with the reflex, is going to be brisk and over um, overactive. Okay. Next, you have difficulty talking. Um, they say it's more of like a nasal quality of speech, so if you used to just pinch your nose like this, you will talk like that, okay? And then because you have difficulty um, speaking as well as the, the nasal quality, it's very hard to understand what they're saying if they are still able to talk, all right? Also, they have difficulty swallowing, which puts you at risk for aspiration and breathing, okay? You also have emotional um, liability, which pretty much they have mood swings. They go up, they go down. And you can think about it, you know, one minute you were walking, talking, and doing everything independently for yourself, and the next minute you're not. Okay, that will frustrate anyone. At times you'll be happy, you know, to see your families and loved ones, but then other times you'll be sad because, you know, you start thinking about, you know, what is going to become of my life after this. Okay? Um, also, cognitive impairment. Okay? Um, before in the, in the books, they have said there is no um, cognitive impairment with ALS, okay? Um, how I was taught there wasn't any cognitive impairment with ALS. The newer books that are coming out, they're saying that um, because some uh, patients do exhibit cognitive impairment, not all, but some do, that they can no longer just say that it doesn't cause cognitive impairment. So with this one, I would say go with whatever your professor tells you. Okay, um, ask your professor, confirm it. If it's in the book, you know, verbatim saying that it does not cause any cognitive impairment, then you have the book on your side to, you know, have as evidence when it's time for the testing. 
If not, go with what your professor says, but ultimately they are the ones that are making the test, okay? And when it comes to NCLEX, you can just go ahead and just um, look to see the questions for ALS and see what answers they have chosen for that and study it that way. But um, even the older doctors, they tell you there is no cognitive impairment. The newer books that are coming out saying that they are. So just want to make that disclaimer out there, all right? So follow your professor with that one. And also respiratory failure, okay? That is the biggest thing with ALS, all right? And a lot of the times of what leads to their death, okay, is the respiratory failure. And with the respiratory failure, um, most of the time they're going to be put on a ventilator or so, so they're not able to get the secretions out. They're more prone for infections. They're more prone to have um, pneumonia and aspiration. So again, with the respiratory failure, these are the things that you can expect, okay? Infection, infection. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and talk about the diagnostic testing. Now, there's not one exact diagnostic testing that's going to let the doctors know or healthcare provider know exactly if um, the patient has ACLF, ALS, but pretty much all of these um, diagnostic tests can help assist in making that diagnosis, okay? So, the first one is pretty much an electromyography and muscle biopsy study. And what it pretty much shows is going to show a decreased function of the motor units, okay? Um, also, you have an MRI, but the MRI may show just high signal intensity um, of the corneal spinal tracts. And this, this is different from the multifocal because on the multifocal, you wouldn't see a high, a high signal intensity, okay? So some, some people may say, oh, but what if... You know, you do the MRI and, you know, you're confusing it for the, multi the multifocal motor neuropathy, okay? So, you're not going to see high signals with the multifocal. With ALS, you would. So, that's how you can kind of um, get the difference. So, then that way you can kind of make a better diagnosis that, hey, this patient has ALS, okay? And then, last but not least, you have your neuropsychological testing, which can also assist. And last but not least, the management for a patient who has ALS, okay? Now, with the management, you want to maintain um, and improve their function of well-being and quality of life, okay? Again, like all the others, uh, G, GBS, and multiple sclerosis, there is no cure, okay? So the only thing you can do is try to uh, prolong um, this as long as possible, okay? Now, with ALS, there is not a good outcome. Uh, the average person lived between three to five years, and the main reason why they die is because of respiratory failure, okay? So, this is pretty much almost like a death sentence, okay? And I don't know if you guys watched the show Empire, where you have Lucius Lyon, and in the very first episode, they thought that he had ALS, and pretty much he was riding off his estates, and all these other things, right? Because he was like, literally, he's going to die within three to five years. He was already planning and looking forward to it, so he was pretty much having things set. Um, of who was getting what, okay, because he thought he was going to have um, this whole death sentence, okay, and in all actuality, he ended up having myasthenia gravis, okay. Now, um, if that helps you to remember that out of every one of them, ALS is the worst just because the time frame that you have, three to five years of life once you are diagnosed with ALS, okay. Um, these are some medication that you can take. So you have Rilazole, which is pretty much a glutamate antagonist. Now, remember, like I was saying before, you had that glutamate, right? Where you have the overexcitation of, of glutamate that is causing the motor neuron cells to die. So, you have an antagonist that helps to block it. And this is seen as a neuroprotective effect in the early stages of ALS. So, unless you're in the early stages of ALS, this won't really be of much help just because... Um, those cells would have already died and you would have already lost the function. But in the case of, you know, it's not dying yet, then you can kind of use this agent to kind of prolong and help with this um, disease, okay? You also have baclofen, dantrolene, sodium, and diazepam, all right? And this is used to help treat the spasticity that the patient will have. So pretty much, again, you're just treating the symptoms. You're trying to, um, you know, increase quality of life as much as possible and just make it more comfortable for them, okay? You also have your mechanical ventilation and your trait care. So after, after some time, the respiratory 
um, part of them will start to fail and they will have to be on a ventilator. They will be, they will be trained and, you know, you want to make sure that you're keeping the tray clean, that, you know, you're suctioning, that you're doing your, your vent protocol as far as, you know, you're cleaning their mouths, you're giving them their paradex, whatever it is that your hospital may, may go by or even when they get home that, you know, whoever is going to be with them, helping them, that they follow um, afterwards and do all these things that are necessary to prolong and keep them infection free as much as possible and um, to give them a, a better quality of life, okay? Also, with the suction, if you're not able to get the suction in, they do recommend that you can do chest physiotherapy to kind of loosen up those secretions here and there, so in that way um, you're able to get it out. Or you can do a lavage once you're um, in the hospital setting and the respiratory therapist will be the one to do the lavage, okay? If the secretions are really, really thick. These patients are eventually going to be pegged Right, because they're gonna have difficulty swallowing those muscles that are that were functioning are no longer functioning anymore, right? So they're going to have a peg that's going to be placed, and this is where they will get their tube feedings, okay? Also, you want them to complete their advanced directives in a time where they're cognitive, where they're able to talk. They may not be able to write, but as long as they're able to talk and you can witness them. Um, they can do their advanced directives and their living will. And mainly just to give them autonomy, let them know that these are decisions that, that, um, that are carried out by them, right? And that way, you know, they can feel as if everything that they wanted done will be done and their wishes will be held and kept. And last but not least is your support group. So you just want to let them know that, hey, you know, they're not in this alone. They can always go to support groups and, and ask, you know, people how do they handle it. You know, they come together and pretty much talk about the emotions that they feel. And sometimes, as family members, we like to be there and kind of comfort them and things like that. But sometimes they may feel as if, like, we just don't understand because we're not in their predicament. We're not in their shoes. So sometimes hearing a story from someone else's shoes um, can definitely make all of the difference in their attitude and in their last moments of, you know, staying on this earth um, until their time has come. Um, so that is pretty much it. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below. Also remember to check out my description box for added information. And again, if you have not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and click that subscribe button. I also have Instagram if you want to check that out as well. And again, thanks for coming on the journey. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.